गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबडी कैन यू ऑल हियर मी यस मैम ओके सो वी हैव लर्न वी हैव हैड ओके सो वी हैव हैड वन लेक्चर ऑफ एमसीएस 213 व्हिच इज योर सॉफ्टवेयर इंजीनियरिंग एंड आई थिंक इट्स क्वाइट वन वीक अगो डू यू ऑल रिमेंबर द बेसिक्स व्हाट वी हैव लर्न इन आवर प्रीवियस लेक्चर i'm just asking uh do you remember even the topics that we have learned in our previous lecture so it was the basic introduction of the software engineering what was the software right you all were present in that class or not yes ma'am yes ma'am okay yes ma'am fine 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 so how many types of models were there there are about five models building okay. text waterfall right. and in waterfall right then there was iterative in experiment model there was prototype there was, model uh, yeah prototype hmm. model and there was uh, rat model okay so it was clear to you what ever we have learned in our previous class right right yes yes ma'am okay so we have left on that class on to the sdlc so sdlc was what it was software development life cycle we have the last topic was cmm what was the full form of cmm you all can hear me yes ma'am okay so what was the full form of cmm we have learned about that model also which was the last model cmm that's what model was i think or a d rapid so uh, application development model no. rad after rad we have also learned about the cmm mo model which was the capability maturity level model there were various levels in that model initial level initial level which was level 0 then level 1 level 2 level 3 level 4 and so on and it was about the industry or the company or the organization the client decides on the basis of the organization the organization falls on to which level then according to the requirement of the client then client just make a decision about the organization so that was into our cmm model i hope you remember now there were five levels it was initial repeatable defined managed and optimizing right uh if i'm asking you something just say yes or no otherwise i'll feel like you are you all are not over here yes ma'am okay okay just keep on just saying yes or no which is very important right as we all know we are on to the online class so this much of interaction is very much needed okay ma'am okay okay let's just proceed for today's topic and uh, let me just admit everybody why don't you people come on time yes you just take them hmm okay so our today's topic and one of the most important topic of the software engineering is sdlc sdlc is what it is your software development life cycle that is the full form of sdlc which is what software development life and cycle and in the short form we always say it as the sdlc 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 okay uh, you must do one thing that if you know sdlc thoroughly then you know the software engineering the entire software engineering or the crux of the software engineering is your sdlc right so it is one of the most important life cycle developmental model which is present in your software engineering subject we are going to understand a number of steps and when we will understand all 
those steps after that we will see that our chapters after this is on the names of those steps only for example if the step one in the sdlc cycle is your requirement analysis phase then later on when, when we will just keep on studying we'll see that we have a chapter which is on the name of this step only and the name of the chapter or the name of the topic is your requirement analysis only right after that we'll see that there is another phase which is your design phase in sdlc so later on we will also go through a chapter whose name is the design of the software so the crux of the entire software engineering is your sdlc right and it is also going to have a number of phases which are going to be very much similar to your waterfall model we have learned about the waterfall model yes ma'am yes okay so there is a lot of similarity between the waterfall model and the sdlc and the basis of the waterfall model is your sdlc only right so as i'm saying it is a software development life cycle by going through this life cycle the entire process of the development of the software gets completed right life cycle if i'm using the term life cycle it means it has a number of the phases it has certain phases phases or we can also say the steps the software is developed by making use of the process and that process includes a number of steps just remember this hierarchy that whenever we are talking about the software development that means the software is going to be developed after following a number of steps after following a certain kind of the process right and that process consists of a number of steps and these steps comes together to form a sdlc that means software development life cycle when all the steps of this sdlc are being followed then we say that a software is truly developed by following all the standards that are that are mentioned in into your sdlc cycle fine then i'll say that there are basically five or four steps into your sdlc it just depend on to the uh, versions of the different books we are just going to understand five phases are there the first phase is your requirement analysis phase then we have the design phase then we have the coding phase and then after that the testing is done and the maintenance is always the forever ongoing phase so these are the number of the phases which are present into your sdlc one more point about the sdlc is that the software can be developed via following the linear steps or it can be developed by via, via following a spiral model or the cyclic steps the steps can be in the linear form one after the another or it could be into the cyclical form right so these are all the phases that we are going to learn today and i was just talking about all these phases or all these steps that our chapters are based on to these steps only that we have a chapter which is named as your requirement analysis then after that design and coding and the software testing and the maintenance we can understand the development of the software process as for example we are developing a house we wanted to develop a 2 bhk house right which has got the two rooms and a and a dining room and the two washrooms are there a kitchen area is there and a living room is there fine so we will just try to establish a an analogy between the development of the software and also in the development of the house how they are going to be similar or what are all the steps that we follow in the development of either a house or of the software fine i have also told you about that the software is software is never manufactured all the another product generally are manufactured but the software is a kind of the product which is not manufactured which is just developed and passed on to the client so in our stlc model we are just going to start with our first phase which is our requirement analysis phase right i'll just establish the analogy that if i am somebody who wanted to develop a house who wanted to uh, just make a house of my own so what will be there into my head there will be the certain things related to the kind of the house that i wanted similarly if i wanted to develop a software then there will be the certain needs of mine that i want my software to fulfill right so those needs those objectives those requirements i am just going to go and tell to my software development company that these are all my requirements which i want my software to 
perform this is the way i want my software to perform so whenever i will answer what of a system or what of a software system then that will be consist inside your requirement analysis phase we'll again understand this it as the name indicates requirement analysis what is the word requirement signifies over here the word requirement signifies what are all the things that we what are all the things that we want our system to perform for ourselves just always have two entities in your head whenever you study about the software engineering one is your client and one is your developer okay developer can be named as the organization it can be named as the company it can be named as the team whenever i am using the term developer that means i am talking about a software developing company that includes a number of the people which comes together to form a team right and whenever i'm talking about the client that could be a user just like us a layman user or that could be another company also how another company could be a client for example there is an automobile company that automobile company is going to go to a software development company for the development of the software which are required in the development of a automobile right excuse me ma'am han ji did you share the screen i can't hear you kindly repeat that uh, i'm not able to hear you repeat that please ma'am did you share the screen no i didn't share the screen you wanted to see the screen i will share the screen i don't have any issue with that not able to hear you your voice is not coming over here ma'am he want to share the screen okay 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 Excuse i'll just share the screen with you all yeah yeah ma'am did you share the Tell screen tell me what you are saying you no i haven't shared the screen did you share the screen I'll just write it down. Shall I proceed? that no worries just a second i'll just share the screen with you all Can you see the screen? Yes, ma'am. We're able to. Visible? Yeah, it's visible. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's not visible to me. Just a second. It's not showing into my system. What you are seeing right now? Can you Same read it? Here. Because it's not visible in my. It's not oh, visible in our. Visible yes, right, right. It's not visible now. That's what I'm saying. It's not visible. I'll try again. still the same man mm -hmm. 
What about now? Yes, it is visible. Okay, now it's visible. Fine. Okay. It's fine now. So I was just discussed. Okay. Hmm. You all have downloaded this PDF. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, I downloaded it. Okay. Let me add the people who are asking me to add. Just a second. Okay, we'll start now. Fine. So we were just studying a very important part of your software engineering, which is your SDLC, right? SDLC, you can see it over here. It is written SDLC. Understood about SDLC? It is software development life cycle. Fine? Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. So I, okay. I was talking about this requirement analysis phase. We were on to this, right? So I was just breaking this word into two. What is your requirement and what is your analysis, right? Requirements are always told by your client. So I was just trying to uh, make you understand who can be a client. I can be a client, a layman or a common person can be a client. I can in any point of my life could be in a requirement of a software, right? So I can just go to a company and can ask the company to develop a software for me. Fine. Similarly, there could be an automobile company, there could be any product manufacturing company who can be in a requirement of any kind of the software. So either the company is going to have a software team of its own. Otherwise, this automobile company is going to go to the software company and ask to develop the software for that particular company. Fine. So client can be anybody. It could be another organization also. It could be a simple common person also. It could be any uh, any kind of the professional or not even a professional, right? Anybody who is in requirement of any software could be considered as a client. So when the client go to a software development company, then what is his first take? His first take would be to tell him what of the software system? What of the software system means? What he wants from the software system? What kind of the system he is in need of so that he moves to a particular organization for the development of that software? There should be certain kind of the requirements. Without any requirement, we do not do anything without any need. Whenever we are in need, and that need should be explained to the software development company in so much of detail that it is like, it has the direct relationship, right? As much as the client is going to explain about his need, as much is going to be your software developed, as much efficient your software is going to be developed. If the requirements are not going to be clear, then do not expect much from the system. Then it comes somewhere onto the shoulders of the client that he's not able to explain his requirement clearly to the development company. It is not just going to come onto the development company that you can just go and blame to the company that you haven't developed the software, as I say, because it is the responsibility of both the sides, the developer also and the client also to explain everything in detail, whatever he even the minute of the details, even the minute of the requirements to the organization so that the organization could understand it, could note it down all the points and then work according to those points that these are all the things that my client required from me or required from the software that I'm going to develop. Then when everything is explained by the client that what he wants from the system, then there is a all the things are noted down they are being just written and a document is being prepared what that document is called that document is called as your software requirement specification document which is your srs document again a very important term of this software development right what is this this is the software requirement specification just think about uh, we are just studying the requirement analysis as the very first phase 
the process we follow in developing any of the software in the similar manner we are studying all these phases the first process followed is your requirement analysis that is why you all can see that it is written on to the number one it is not any haphazard way in which all these points are written that we can go by the requirement analysis and then we can go to the software testing no it cannot be done like this there is a hierarchy that needs to be followed okay first of all the requirement analysis is there obviously we are just going to tell about the requirements then we are going to go to the next part if the requirement analysis is not clear then we cannot go to any of the part we cannot go to all these phases or all these steps or all these points no and even if we go without clearing our requirement analysis then there shouldn't be much expectations that we should keep from our software Right. So I was talking about the software requirement specification. So client tell all the requirements that these are all the points that I want from my software. All these points are noted down. They are being documented and they are being written down into a document, which is called as your software requirement specification. And in the Madam in Afghanistan is Airtek. What you said? Madam, Airpick, Airpick. Airpick is what? In Afghanistan is Airpick now. Earthquake, Air? Earthquake. He's talking about Earthquake. Earthquake. Okay, 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 okay. Earthquake. I'm so sorry. You all are fine or not? I think we are fine. Maybe it's in oh, is We are in different location. In our location, it's not Earthquake. Okay. Just settle down all those who are going through the earthquake and we'll start. Which place, which province is earthquake now? I hope it is not of high magnitude. Uh, we are just continuing with this. Okay. So we are talking about the software requirement specification. I hope you all are fine. That is why I'm just continuing. Okay. Software requirement specification. Again, we are just going to bifurcate this word, which is your software with, and again, the requirements and the specification means what are all the requirements of the software? They are just going to be jotted down into a document and that document is your SRS. Remember SRS. You can even get the question into your exam, not just writing the software requirement specification document. Generally, whenever we talk, whenever we study, it is always written as the SRS document. Understood? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So after the requirement analysis, after everything is being told by the customer or the client that these are all the requirement, all those requirements are jotted down, we go to our next phase. Okay. P means the development company. Okay, the development company is going to move to the or jump to the next phase or the next step. That next step is your design phase. Fine. What comes to the design phase? The design phase basically deals with the logical design of your software. Logical designing means, for example, we are just going to create a blueprint of the software. Blueprint of the software means we are just going to draw the inflow of the information into the software and the outflow of the information which is going to go from the software means the entire processing is now just going to be is now just going to be designed it is not going to be coded just just do not confuse between the designing and the coding do not understand that designing means the coding part the coding is the another phase fine for example we all make use of a map whenever we go from one location to the another location right we all use the google map yes. do you all use the google map or yes. not okay. yes, yes mom use okay use now fine so before starting our journey or before going to any of the place what we do we are sitting on to our uh, source location and we'll just see the entire path from where we have to go these are all the cities that are going to come in between to our destination location 
right so what we do at that point of the time we are just designing our journey we are just seeing the design of our journey that we are going to follow we are just going to see the design of the path we are going to follow while traveling from our source to our destination right similarly before actually coding the software what we do we just make a design of the entire process what are all the modules which are going to be into my software what are all the how the information is going to flow which are all the clients which are all the interfaces what are all the subsystems right before going or before jumping onto the coding part we just make a blueprint of the entire software system and that blueprint of the entire software system is called as your design we can also under understand it from the another example for example we wanted to again we just wanted to build a house right so before building a house what we have we have a map of the house do we all have a map when we know that this is how my house is going to look after it is going to be constructed what that map has that map has all the things which are going to be present into your house similarly from where you're going to enter from where you're going to exit what is the entry what is the entry exit what are all the uh, how many types of rooms are there what will be the size of the rooms similarly all the basic details what is going to be there into your software is what we do before actually entering into the coding part we just develop a blueprint of everything right whenever we make a sketch what we do we just draw the sketch by uh, putting the dots dot 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 what we are doing at that point of the time we are just creating a blueprint we are just creating before going to the final picture we are just creating a sample of that picture right so that is our design phase basically it is of two type we have got the primary design phase and we have got the secondary de design phase right in the primary design phase the software system is going to be developed at the block level block we can understand or we can understand it as the modules right means the entire system is broken down into the pieces we cannot work on to the entire software system at once we don't do like that what we do we just always try to follow the divide and conquer approach you must have heard about the divide and conquer approach yes yes ma yes yes ma'am yes so so as a software development company we have a problem right that problem is going to be divided into the now we know the solution of the problem but in spite of reaching to the solution all in one step what we do we divide the solution into different different parts that these are all my sub solutions and i'm going to give it to my different different teams that you work on to this solution number one you work on to the solution number two you worked on to the solution number three or you can say at it as the blocks you work on to the block one of my problem you work on to the block two of my problem you work on to the block three of my problem right we all just combine all the blocks together at the end and we just reach on to our final solution so into the primary design phase what we do we just divide the problem into the blocks and then we work on to those problems accordingly right then into the secondary design phase what happens the now we are just going to enter the details of the block primary design phase just break your problem into the different blocks secondary design phase now take one block and just go to the detailed design of that block what is going to be present into that block how the interface of that block is going to be what will be the entry what will be the exit how the information is going to flow and how the information is going to come out so everything the all the detailed part of a block or every block is dealt into your secondary design phase so whenever we are designing or whenever we are developing a software the process we follow is just break down your development process into the different different steps then take one block take one chunk of the problem and give the detailed design of that chunk of the problem take the another chunk of the problem and and just deal with the detailed design of the second chunk of the problem and accordingly we are going to work on to the entire set of the problem so this is what we do into the design just Uh, remember two things about the design first is your two phases which is your primary design phase secondary design phase primary design phase just remember that you are working on to the blocks 
working onto the blocks means you are dividing the problem and then you are achieving onto a certain solution right secondary design design phase now you are going into the details of the block what is going to be there into your block that comes under your secondary design phase and to deal very specifically with the design phase you just need to remember it deals with the logical part of your software system and also comprises of the blueprint of your entire software development system understood yes ma'am okay we can also uh, and the next point is after this is your stt just remember the output of your requirement analysis phase is always your SRS. SRS was what? Software requirement specification. Client is there, told everything, whatever the needs of the client, a document is prepared. So when the development team is coming out of the requirement analysis phase, what will be the output? The output will be your software requirement specification. Right? Now, just see the step and i'll just try to mark it i hope you'll understand just a second hmm. okay so this is my requirement analysis phase i'm coming out of this phase what i will be having i'll be having the srs So right. Just remember, uh, just imagine that I'm writing it as the SRS, right? This is my requirement analysis phase. The output of this requirement analysis phase is what? SRS. Now, I'm entering into this second phase. What is the second phase? The second phase is my design phase. So when the development team is entering into the design phase, what it has with it, it has the SRS document with it, right? So SRS document is going to act as the input for the design phase, whereas the SRS document is the output of your requirement analysis phase. So we are onto the design phase. The input is going to be your SRS document and the output of this design phase is going to be your SDD, which is your software design document. As I'm saying, as I'm telling you that we are just creating a blueprint of your entire system or the logical blueprint of your entire system so that is going to be created somewhere there should be there is going to be a document and that document name of that particular document which have details of all the designing part is what is your software design document the name of that particular document is your software design document so i've told you three important things about this design phase one is it is the logical designing Fine. Also called as the blueprint of the system, consists of two types. One is your primary design. Consists of two steps. First is your primary design phase. Second is your secondary design phase. Primary design phase deals with the development or the identification of the blocks. Secondary design phase deals with the detailed design of every block. And the input to the design phase is your SRS, which was the output of your requirement analysis phase. And the output of your of your design phase is software design document which is also called as the std then after that these are all the general tasks involved in the design process i have explained you about that you can read them and you will be able to understand them fine you all can hear me now Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes plans. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, okay. So, these are all the points that needs to be taken into consideration whenever we are designing a software document, right? So, whenever we are just dealing with the SDD, that is the software design document, it should be very much practical, it should be efficient, it should be flexible, and it should be security is always a concern whenever we are developing any kind of the software. I think we all must be aware with that, that whenever we are talking about the software, security, flexibility, efficiency, and the practicality are the four important points that we all need to take into consideration, right? And 
to just explain all these points i think we all know what the practicality means it should be very much functional it should be intelligence it should have at least the uh, average intelligence of a person then efficiency means the your software system should be very accurate it should uh, just perform in in a particular amount of the time it should not take a lot of amount of time that means it should have a good performance and it should provide us the output that is being expected from your software so the software design document needs to consider all these four points which is your practicality efficiency flexibility and the fourth one is your security part so we have covered these two points which is your requirement analysis phase and which is your design phase after dealing with them we are coming on to our third phase or the third step of the SDLC, which is your software development life cycle, which is your coding part. So we have the designing, we have, uh, now we know what we need to develop, right? It is there in front of us in the form of a document, SDD. Finally, we reaches on to our next phase, which is our coding part. Now the thing which is left is your coding part, actually creating the software because without coding, the software cannot be created. So. The input to the coding phase is your STD document, right? Which was the output of which phase? STD document was the output of? Design phase. Designing phase. Very good. Okay. So in the coding, that output is going to work as the input for the coders. There is a team which and this team of the people is efficient in doing the coding. So what they're going to have, they need to have certain input for them now so that they can understand. It is not like that there is just a, a bunch of the people who are working on to all the faces. No, that is why we have created the separate document so that we can pass on to all these documents from one team to another team. Okay, there is a team who is handling the requirement analysis phase. So that team is going to have its output in the form of SRS. And now the requirement analysis phase team is going to transfer this SRS document to the design team. Now design team have developed the SDD. So design team is going to transfer the SDD to the coding team of the software development company. Fine. So what happens in the case of the coding? In this phase, different different modules are coded by making use of any high level language. There is a programming language. There are certain set of people who are efficient in doing the programming in that particular language. So a high level language is being chosen and all the modules of the code are all the modules of the softwares are coded by making use of that language. Right. And while doing the coding, there is a certain set of guidelines or the standard guidelines which needs to be followed. It's not like that ki randomly as we people in our classes do the coding that we just have a single program of, uh, for example, the addition of the two numbers and we are just going to start writing the program, not writing the comments, not following any standards, not following any guidelines. No, it's not like that because in any software company, the people kept on changing. They kept on switching, leaving one company going to another company. So whenever the another person comes and join that particular company, he must understand whatever being quoted by the previous person who have left the company. So for that, there are certain set of standards and the guidelines that are being mentioned, which needs to be followed by the coders of that particular company. Right. So what these guidelines include, these guidelines includes First is your name of the module, right? You have to mention on which module you're working. So just mention the name of the module. Then all the internal and the external document of the source code needs to be present. Then if any modification is being done into your coding, then that, that history should also be there, there. And the fourth point is the uniform appearance of the code. There is a certain set of standards in order to maintain the uniformity, which needs to be followed by the coder. So all these points needs to be taken into consideration whenever the coding team is doing the coding part of the software development life cycle. Understood? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Fine. So we have reached still the coding phase. What we have with us right now, we have a coded document. Coded, I will not say coded document. We have a coded software right now. Okay. After coding, the software is ready. All the modules are interacting with each other. They are fine. They are working. Right. So after the development process, we are going to go where we are going to our next phase, which is also one of the very important phase of the software development life cycle. We are also going to 
just uh, read or study about the entire chapter onto this, which is our testing phase. So before handling our software to the client, we need to just test it very thoroughly. Fine. So we haven't handed over the software to the company. How we are going to test it to the customer or the client? How we are going to test it? What the company do? It just make a number of the te random test cases. Means a random amount of the data is being created, which is going to put into the software and then it is tested. They are not the live data. It is not like that. You just have the live data. It's just the random set of the data which is created and we just run our software onto that data so that we can test our software and we can just find out the errors which are present into the software. Because as we all know, how much we try, but there is always a possibility of the errors in the software that we create. There is no software which is error free. Fine. So before we know the errors are going to come into the software, the software is being developed. Now the next step is to find out those error and to correct those error as much as we can. Fine. Whenever I say we, that means the develop, developing company. I'm talking on behalf of the developing company, right? So the next important thing now is to find out the errors. And in order to find out the errors, what we need to do, we need to create the test cases. First, we create the test case. We will just provide all these test cases to the uh, software and then we are just going to see whether there is any error or not. If there is any error, we are just try to eradicate or remove that error. And if there is no error that the company is going to find, there is a certain percentage of the efficiency that our software is providing. Then we are going to go to the next phase. That means we are going to hand, it, hand over our system to the client. That this is the system that we have developed which is according to us right now is error free if there is any error comes into the near future then we have the another phase which is your maintenance phase before moving on to the maintenance phase we are going to just learn more about that uh, whenever we do the coding at our part for example i have made a code in the c language about addition of the two numbers so whenever i run my uh, code what i do i just before running or before executing, it just shows me the error. If there is any error into my that particular code, it's just the five lines or the 10 lines of the code, right? Even if that 10 lines of the code has got any error, that is also been uh, told by my system or the language which I am using. That particular set is called as the debugging. Debugging means I am develop while developing the code, the software developer carries out some testing, and this is known as the debugging. Means I have developed the code, but when I try to execute it, it is not working. It is showing me all these errors. So that time when the coder itself is handling with the error, that time is called as the debugging of the error. Right. But testing is testing is meant for meant for finding the existence of the defects in the entire system even after the debugging has been done because the debugging is done onto the module levels or onto the program levels right but the testing is done there are many types of testing also generally when the testing is performed onto the entire system the overall software that time we say that even after the debugging, the errors are there into the system. The defects are there as we are what we are doing that we are breaking entire system into different parts. When we mix or when we bring together all the chunks, I'm seeing you the modules, the blocks, when we bring together all the modules together, they can perform well separately. Module one is performing well separately. Module two is performing well separately. But when I bring them together, what happens? Then there can be another kind of the defects that could appear. So testing deals to eradicate that kind of the defect, which appears after creating the entire system, after uh, conquering uh, after dividing and then we just mix everything together right when we create the entire system together at that time when the error came or when the defects came that is being corrected by making use of the testing phase of your software development life cycle fine after that we are go going to understand about the objectives that needs to be kept in mind while performing the testing fine what generally we have in our thought what generally we have in our mind is that that 
we just don't want to face the errors we have developed something and we just wanted to feel that we have developed a very good system it's a general human notion right but whenever we are performing testing we just be we just need to be very much curious about the errors that if i am a tester my achievement would be if i'll be able to find the error right so error should be considered as a friend at that time not as a foe just uh, May just bring out that uh, human notion from your mind and work on to what work on to finding the errors because as much error we will be able to find we should have the intention of finding the error right as much errors we will be able to find as much efficient our system will be fine so that is being written as the objective of performing the testing what first point is it should be done with the intention of finding the errors i told you the intention should be not to just escape from the errors the intention should be finding the errors right the second thing is how we will be able to find the errors for that we need to develop the very good test cases the data which we are developing now for finding the errors that should be very very good we should not in any point of the time we should have the intention to just save ourselves from the errors so that we we will be just able to deliver our product in a hurry no not at all if it is going to if it's not going to be error free then it is just going to take more amount of us as compared to this so as much amount of the time we spent into the into the testing phase that would be good for our software only and the third important point is a success test is one that uncovers yet undiscovered errors right so the entire aim of the testing phase is to uncover the undiscovered errors those error errors which haven't come yet still when we will be able to find out those undiscovered errors that will be that that testing will will, will be uh, called as the successful testing that testing will be mentioned or named as yes the testing team has done good because it has uncovered it has revealed all those errors which were like the hidden errors understood yes okay now we are just going to see how the testings are performed on to the various level different types of testing we are going to uh, learn in in detail in our chapters whenever we are going to study about the chapters of the testing before that we are just going to see this bifurcation these three four lines are very very important we should just understand it just read it the entire system is broken down it's written built up i know built out i know that but i'm just trying to make you understand it like this the just imagine a entire software system first of all we are just going to divide that entire software system into what sub systems we are just going to make the parts and we'll say that these are the sub systems of my overall system just consider it as the overall system now i have this part i have this part i have this part i have this part all these four or five parts are called as the sub systems okay again we are going to do the bifurcation of this sub subsystems we are just going to divide the subsystems also now the subsystems are this was one of my subsystem i'm going to break it down from here and these will be two modules of one subsystem right now this is my subsystem 2 again i'm going to break it down now these are another two modules of my subsystem so system is divided into subsystems and subsystems are divided into modules mm -hmm. and modules are divided into the functions and the procedures so this is how we also perform the testing i think if you can see this can you see this note yes ma'am okay this uh, written as system subsystem modules procedures you all can see that na this white note just uh, a little zoom out let's do okay. uh i'll just read it uh, it's not zoomed out or just a second i'll try it's okay it's okay ma'am it's okay no it's not even changing its size it's just a note fine so just to make you understand it is all these points now which are written over here where i'm moving my cursor they are just being shortened down into the, into these four lines okay you can remember them like this first of all the unit level testing is performed the un unit these are 
the points are unit level testing, module level testing, subsystem level testing. These are all the types of the testing. Okay, we have another types of the testing, but currently we are just going to see about them. So just read the first line. The system is broken broken down into subsystem. Subsystem is broken down into modules, and modules are broken down to, into procedures and functions, which are the parts of our program only. Right? Whenever we write a program, it consists of the procedures and the functions. You can even write the program also over here. Fine. Now, unit level testing is performed onto what? It is used for performing the testing onto our procedures and functions. Second, module level testing is used for performing the testing onto our modules. Third. Subsystem level testing, it is used for, for performing the testing onto our subsystem. And the fourth is our system level testing, which is used to perform onto our system. As we have divided our system into the various parts, that is our system is broken down into subsystem, modules, procedures, functions. Similarly, we have also divided, divided the testing also. We have the unit level testing for the procedures and functions. We have got the module level testing for our modules then we also have our subsystem level testing for the subsystems and the entire level testing for our for our entire system which is called as the system level testing so just try to understand it, it how much important is the testing phase that we have we have started testing from the procedures and functions only it's not like that key we have developed the entire system and then we are performing the testing at the last which is our system level testing it's not happening like that okay we are just performing the testing starting from from our procedures and functions then we are moving on to the modules we are performing the module level testing we are moving on to the subsystem we are performing the subsystem level testing we are moving on to the entire system and then we are going to go to a system level testing understood yes okay yes, then we have divided fine good okay these are all the levels of testing which we will be studying into our testing wala chapter right it's not like that we will just uh, be remembering the names of these testing no we will be understanding them thoroughly what is unit level testing what is subsystem level testing later on okay now there are two types of testing strategies that are present to us. The first is our code testing and second is our specification testing. The code testing strategy examines the logic of the system. Okay, what happens in this? The analyst develops the test cases for every instruction. Mom, in the... can you zoom out? What should I use? Can you zoom out the chapters? Mm -hmm. I'm not able to understand what you're saying. Zoom. I should zoom them. Uh, also, we can zoom out the picture. No problem, madam. You can zoom out the picture. You Just, can't see uh, properly. I can zoom. Can you see the... Yes, ma'am. Okay. You all have this document. Eh? You all can study it later on also. Right now, you can just have a look like that only. Okay. Just we are reading all these points. We are going through all these points. I know you all can download it from the internet, right? MCS 213. Thoroughly, you can read it on your own. I'll just make you understand what are all the important points that you must understand. It's not like that. Ki I'm just going through all these points line by line that you have to just focus them very much. No, it's not like that. Okay. 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 Hmm. You all have this document. Just go through it later on. Fine. So. There are the two testing strategies which are present. We have got the code testing and we have got the specification testing. What happens in the code testing? Code testing means every instruction that is written into your code. Okay, instruction means whatever the uh, programming language is used, you write the instructions, you do the coding part, everything is being checked, everything is being tested into your code testing phase. Specification testing means only the specific or the particular things are tested. Okay, it's not like that key. each and every line will be tested. No, as the name indicates, there are there will be the specific or the particular test cases that will be developed 
and then the testing will be performed so these are the two types of the strategies either you do the line by line by line or the instruction wise testing or you just do the take the specific part of your code and just perform the testing onto that so these are the two types of the strategies that can be followed then after that moving on to these two types of the testing techniques, which is the white box test testing and the black box testing. We are going to study about them in so much of detail that it's not necessary right now for us to just understand there are again two types of testing. And after even after studying these two types of testing, we have another many, many types of the testing. So we will just be we will be just studying all the types of the te testing in details in our coming chapter, right? Just understand there are again two types of the testing. The black box testing is there and the white box testing is also there. We will learn them very, very thoroughly. Then we have covered these two phases. We have done the requirement analysis. We have done the designing phase. We have the coding phase. We have the testing phase. And now we are going to move on to the next and the last phase of your STLC, which is your maintenance phase. So we have come over here. So what happens? Every types of the testing is done white box is done black box is done specification testing is done code testing is done right module testing is done unit level testing is done every type of the testing is done the company has found out that okay as much error we can find out we can discover we have done that now from our part the software is ready so what happens the software is being handed over to the client or the customer who has asked to develop the software right now even after and handling over the software there is again a phase that comes into picture the name of that phase is your maintenance yeah. phase it is the responsibility yeah. of the software development company to maintain your software whatever you have developed if there is any error that has come into the software that needs to be rectified if any updation is there that also needs to be rectified if there is a requirement to do any kind of the change into the program that also needs to be done so all these things comes into your maintenance phase what we say that we say that there are four phases of sdlc which are like we can say that this they, they start and they finish but the last phase of your sdlc is is like the phase which never gets over it is a continuous phase which goes into the loop and it is also considered as the longest phase of your SDLC. Maintenance phase is the longest phase because till the time the software user is going to use the software, till that time the maintenance phase is going to go on and on and on and on. Fine. So anything that is happening in, into your software, we all make use of the WhatsApp. Yes we we all make use of the whatsapps and we what we what we experience we experience that there are always the updation requests that kept on coming onto the whatsapp that there is updation requ request now just update your software okay these are all the features that are added into the whatsapp just uh, switch on those features so what is this the whatsapp company has delivered the software to us now we all are making use of the software whatsapp but still they are working on to that particular software. So on which phase they are working? They are working into your maintenance phase. They are providing you the updations. The company is giving you the updation. That is when you are able to update your WhatsApp, right? So maintenance phase is considered as the longest phase. So anything happens into your software, even after the delivery of the product, even after the delivery of the software, is the responsibility of the company and is something which is handled into the maintenance phase right yes ma'am okay so you just need to remember this it's not it's not like that nobody can remember everything written over here okay and it is not even a need to remember each and everything. But what you should learn, you should learn the crux of each and every phase. If you know the crux of each and every phase, then it is like you understand the phase. Now it is like for your whole life that you can talk about that particular phase. Fine. So any kind of the wear and tear happens into the software is dealt by the maintenance phase. Points to remember, any error has come any change in the program needs to be uh, performed 
or any of the updation in the hardware or the software is required comes into the maintenance phase of your software development life cycle. So when all these phases gets completed, then we say that a software is being developed accordingly following the certain set of standards, following the certain set of guidelines and in a proper manner. Okay. Okay, ma'am. And with this, we are also like completed our first chapter. And now we are going to go and jump into our second chapter. What was the first phase of SDLC? Requirement gathering. Requirement analysis, right. What is the name of this unit two? Requirement analysis. Right. So as I've told you, all the phases of the SDLC are the separate separate units for us, right? The first phase was requirement analysis. So after completing our unit one, which was the basic of our software engineering, we have jumped on to the unit two, which is what our first phase of SDLC and the first phase of SDLC was what it was the requirement analysis phase. So we are able to relate with it. We will always relate with the SDLC. So after the completion of this lecture, what you need to do today, you need to revise your SDLC thoroughly. If you know about the SDLC, just consider yourself that you know most of the part of your software engineering, at least the building block or the basic of the software engineering. Because in our coming chapters, each and every phase is going to be a unit. And we'll start with the first phase of the SDLC, which was your requirement analysis phase. So this unit also named like that, which is the principles of the software requirement analysis. We'll just start with it. So we have understood about what was the requirement analysis. Can you just repeat it? What we have understood about the requirement analysis? Gathering the data and making resources. Gathering the data, understanding the objectives, understanding the needs, understanding the requirement of the user is your requirement analysis phase. So what I said, understanding the need, understanding the objective, understanding the requirement, understanding the what of the system is comes under the requirement analysis phase. Can you all remember that? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. And what, how it is defined? It is defined as first is first point is identifying, defining, and analyzing the requirements is known as the requirement analysis phase. So these important three points, which are going to be deal in this chapter or in this unit, identifying the requirement defining the requirement and analyzing the requirement, identifying how asking by the customer, defining, you know, just a broad point. Now you need to define every detail of that broad point, which comes under the defining of the requirement analysis, whatever you have written, whatever you have defined in your requirements, then just doing a thorough brainstorming of all those points, whether they are achievable or not, whether they are feasible or not. There shouldn't be any requirement that is not feasible enough or that is not achievable enough. Your client could ask you anything, right? It is the company. It is the job of the company to understand that you need to analyze your requirement before going on to the next phase, which is your designing phase. You need to understand that all those requirements that are being mentioned by my client are achievable. They are not just into the, into the air, right? So these are all the things that is being done into your requirement analysis phase. Next is we have understood it very well. I think a number of times identification of the end user requirement, preparation of a corresponding document called as the SRS document, then analysis and object validation of the requirement document and the identification of the further requirement if there are any by the client, right? Next, we are going to understand it this what are all the types of requirement right this is important the requirements are basically divided onto two types the first on the basis of their priority and next is on the basis of their functionality 
right so on the basis of the priority the requirements are classified into the following three types the first is those requirement that should be absolutely met right there will be a certain set of requirements which will be like you have to have to met all those requirements in my software system second is there will be a set of requirements which are highly desirable by the customer okay these are all the things which which should also be there into my software but even if they are not going to be there then also it will be fine for me right so these are the second type of the requirements which will be highly desirable but not necessary as the first type of the requirement then third point is those requirements that are possible but could be eliminated means there are certain requirements that are being put up by the client they are possible but it they are not so necessary that the company should just put so much of efforts for uh, for meeting those requirements they could be eliminated right so these are all the three types of the requirement on the basis of the priority the so first type is certain set of the requirements obviously have to be met second is highly desirable but not necessary and third is they are possible but not not necessary they could be eliminated we can just eradicate them that our system is going to work even if these requirements are not going to be fulfilled so that comes into the third category now requirements are also divided onto the basis of their functionality and this is much more important anybody can ask you how many types of the requirement on the basis of the functionality so there are two types of the requirement on the basis of the functionality the first is your functional requirement and the second is your non functional requirement basis of functionality hai so they are named like that only first is your functional requirement and second is your non functional requirement so what comes under the functional requirement when the factors like input output format storage structure computational capability timing and synchronizations are defined they are defined over where they are defined into my functional requirement of the system non functional requirement means how much will be the efficiency of the system performance of the system space of the system how much amount of the space my software is going to acquire how, how much will be the reliability of the system means the qualitative aspect of the system comes under the non functional requirement and the factors like what will be the input output format right how much which kind of the storage structure i am going to use what will be the type of the data structures which are going to be present how much will be the computational uh, capability of the system okay how i am going to establish the synchronization among the various modules of my system so all these things are comes under the functional requirement and the qualitative aspect like the usability efficiency performance space reliability all these points comes under the non functional requirement understood now we are going to see the srs i just we have just talked about the srs in our sdlc right yes so what i told you i told you that it is a document that consists of the all the specifications of the requirement of the user so just see how many points are there into the srs document this is the outline of the srs document that the requirement analysis team needs to fill these are just the head points or the headings first of all the requirement analysis team has to fill over here what is the purpose of your software what will be the scope of the software then all the definitions acronyms abbreviations that are being used in in this entire document right then reference is used then overview of the document this was the introduction part the second chapter of the srs document will be the overall description the specifications according to the product perspective then the product functions then the user characteristic then the constraint assumptions dependencies external interfaces functional requirement performance requirement logical database and so on these are the number of the points which are present into your srs these are not less point right so it it is not like that ki we will just remember the one line or the two line of, about the srs just try to imagine the situation that this is the entire file which has all the points written and the requirement analysis team needs to mention very specifically very clearly about all these points then only this document will be handed over to the design team if the first phase of the sdlc is not performed properly then we can see that the overall development of the system is in doubt only right 
the first step needs to be very much clear the first step needs to be correct then only the entire process or the entire system which is going to be developed is going to be good so this is this is the first step this srs document is the is the soul of your software development fine and these are all the points which are there which needs to be filled by the requirement analysis team i hope you understand it yes ma'am yes ma'am i understand okay the next is the problems in the srs we have so many points written so there will be uh, there will be a problem or there will be a probability of the problem in each and everything right so we just need to just take two points in consideration first is the complete requirements are difficult to uncover we always have this uh, door open for more requirements to come to us right we always have given this opportunity uh, this liability to the customer that even if i am into my design phase then also you can come and tell me your requirements right so when i have given this liability to my customer then what happens it has become a problem into my srs document i have formed a document now the customer comes with the another requirement now it is difficult for the requirement analysis team to just jot it down and just make the modifications modifications could be like in the entire system or it could be specific if the modifications are specific then it's fine but if they are moving the entire system then that could be a problem second is requirements are continuously generated I, as i have told you right now that requirements are never over they are like the person is going to come with one requirement today even if after the entire meeting with the customer entire session of the even if it's going to be a session of the five meetings then also there will be certain requirement that would be left to the customer side and he will come back to the development team with the another set of the requirements so these are the certain set of the problems that kept on coming because we have this definite or the standard format present to us the company has to fill this format then only it is going to go to the next step if this format is not going to be completed the person is going to come then and again then it's going to be a difficult or it's going to be a problem for the SRS team or the SRS documentation part, right? Next, we are going to go to, okay, we are going to discuss about the different tools which are used for gathering the requirement. Now, it's not like that, that we are just creating or we are just uh, having a meeting with our customer and then we'll just write down all the requirements. Now, as we have uh, developed a lot into our software development field, so we have a number of the requirement gathering tools. Now, the tools are also available to us. First is record review. Just remember about all these tools. They're also very important, right? First tool says named as the record review tools. What it says means a company have a set of recorded documents already. If the company has worked on to the onto the uh, development of the software previously also so it has the certain set of the document available to it what those document could be those document could be the procedures manuals forms or the books which needs to be reviewed to see the format and functions of the present system means we have got a certain history available to us we can go and check in available to us in the form of the manuals in the form of the forms in the form of the books what we can do we can just make or we can just make use of those things which are available to us and can uh, can take the certain advantages of our previous experience so we will just check our record review also whatever is recorded to us we can just we are just going to see all the points whether we are missing on to any point or not and we just going to take that into the consideration so whatever previous things available to us that are also going to be for the benefit to us second is on-site observation on-site observation means if we are just developing a system which is a real life based system what the team is going to do the team is going to go on to that particular site and actual site and then have a closer look of the system so that comes as a tool for us if we are developing a real life based system and that is named as the on-site observation going to the particular site going to the particular location and just have a look about that particular location and then deciding about the development of the software according to that or deciding about the requirements according to that right that comes under the on-site observation 
then the next tool will be the interview obviously there will be there will be an interaction with the staff is performed in order to identify the requirement what it requires it requires the experience of arranging the interviews setting the stages avoiding the arguments and evaluating the outcomes right so the development team just uh, conduct the interview part also in order to just interview means you can understand the brainstorming part you're just asking the problems you're just giving the problem to the person sitting in front of you and just expecting the perspective of the person about that particular problem so that happens into the interview that is what interview is all about you just give the question to the person and you just wanted to know the perspective of that person about that particular problem so that is also being set into the and also worked as a tool for gathering the requirements because whatever the person is going to tell he's going to tell according to his own perspective so that could be an important point for the company right fourth kind of the tool could be your questionnaire questionnaire may, means a set of the questions are written onto a documents related to your development right related to your requirements question number one related to requirement question number two question number three four five six similarly 50 questions are developed or the 100 questions are developed these questions are just this these set of questions is called as the questionnaires right and this questionnaire is going to be given to the customer and then customer is just going to note down the answer of those questions and by reading the answers then the company decides the particular sets right in spite of just it is like in the written form questionnaire is basically a set of the questions into the written form and it is also be considered as a very effective tool which requires the less effort and produces a written document about the requirement fine so these are all the four types of the tools which are there you have got the record review means just going going to check your history whatever work the company has done in the earlier or in the past then that records are being again checked it is on-site observation going back to the actual location and checking the requirements interview just asking your staff or interacting with your staff and asking about the requirements then the fourth is your questionnaire it is a set of the questions considered as a very effective tool and just you get the answers in the form of the written document which are considered as the much beneficial for the developing team right so these are all the tools then after that we are going to move on to the modeling the system architecture modeling the system architecture means these are all the models that are being followed first model is our environmental model then after that we have got the behavioral model and after that we are going to just study about the part of this behavioral model we are going to study about the dfds we are going to study about the er diagrams we are just going to study about the data dictionaries in the second behavior model only before going on to that we are going to see or we are going to understand this line what it says before the actual system design commences the system architecture is model i have told you we create a map before actually building our house similarly we create a model before actually developing the software so there are two types of model one is your environmental model second is your behavior model what the environmental model says the environmental model indicates the environment in which the system exists for example we have got a college now the environment for the college would be the higher organization for the college could be the university to which the college belongs and the university could be related to what the national education system so all these parts and the department could have its environment as the college so department environment is college college environment is your university and the university environment is your national education system so in the environment model basically the interfaces should be clearly indicate the inflow and the outflow of the information from the system now the college needs to interact with the department and college also needs to interact with the university so this inflow and the outflow of the information or all these interfaces needs to be considered very well in the case of the environmental model environment means the uh, interaction that the system is going to do while working that is considered as the environment or we can given it as the another term is the interfaces also whether the college software should have 
a interface with the only the department of the colleges or it should have an interface with the university also or the university should have an interface with the national education system also so that comes under the environmental model now we are going to move on to the behavioral model what the behavior model describe it describes the operational behavior of the system in this model the various operations of the system are represented in the pictorial form all the things all the models which we are going to study now whether it is going the dfts which is your data flow diagrams or the er diagrams or the process specification they comes under the behavior model behavior model means how a particular what will be the process which is going to be followed by is going to be followed for the development of the software is comes under the behavior model how the operations of the software is going to be performed what will be the set of the steps what what will be the process how to represent it that comes under your behavior model the representation is always done in the in the pictorial form just understand behavioral model means it describes the operational behavior of the system how the operations or how the system is going to be function is come comes under the behavioral model and it is always represented into your pictorial form always the use of the pictures are done in order to represent any of the process flow into your system just we will just understand it more clearly when we are going to see it for example what we have the first behavioral model is our data flow diagrams or the dfds it is also very important what it shows as the name indicate flow of the data through a system just imagine for example uh you just need to submit an assignment you have your own system on software for example your university is working onto the software or uh, you can just imagine this ignu system right you're taking your classes through the system you are just submitting the assignment through the system right you're getting your marks through the system everything is going through a particular software system which is your ignu software system so what it do before developing this entire system what we do we just make a sketch of this inflow of the information or this outflow of the information what is the inflow of the information if you're getting your marks or the result on to the ignu website only that is for you it is an inflow of the information the information is coming to you right and if you are submitting your assignment that is the outflow of the information for you the information is going from you so this entire thing is just put into the pictorial form before actually developing the system we need to develop the blueprint of the system and how we develop the blueprint of the system we develop the blueprint of the system by making use of the data flow diagrams by making use of the dfds or another we can just uh, adopt the another approach also that another approach could be the er diagrams that that another approach could be the data dictionaries that another approach could be any of the ux diagrams right but presently we are discussing about the data flow diagrams i think you must be understanding this example that how the information is going from you and how the information is coming to you so that is being represented in these pictorial representation there is an external entity which is putting the data it is going through the level one processing is being done another external entity putting the data the output is an intermediate result going through another kind of the processing then again an intermediate result or the data is being produced then going through the another level of the processing and the output data is being generated we can understand it it like this for example this is external entity is my student one right this is student one this is student two now student one is putting his assignment to the ignu system this is the ignu system right student 2 is also putting his assignment into the ignu system now what is happening the assignment is going through various stages first is the assignment one is going to the uh, assignment one is going to your reviewer or the checker of your assignment or the teacher of your assignment or the particular subject right that particular teacher is checking your assignment is forwarding the marks of your assignment to the system again now the by and the assignment 2 is also being submitted by this student 2 now the teacher is also processing the uh, assignment 2 he is taking the assignment 2 generating the marks bring out the marks over here now what happens 
after all your assignments are being checked you are getting the actual result in front of you that these are all the marks that you have got into your assignment and that actual result is again coming back to student one or the external entity here i have named external entity as a student one here also the external entity is the student one so this is how the information travels from one system to the another system coming from one system going through another stage then the third stage then the fourth stage and finally an output is being generated and that output is going to basically to the person who should receive that output understood this graph yes ma'am okay so just imagine about your own system about your igloo system right just replace this external entity as the student this is my student this is my student and this circle thing as the internal processes processing that is being performed by your software system of the igloo fine so that is happening over here so how we are what we are doing in the dfds we are showing the outflow and the inflow of the information or the processing or the how the function is performed into your system by making use of these entities by making use of this rectangle we are showing the flow of the information by making use of this arrow then these circles or the ovals are being used and this uh, two lines are being used so we are just going to learn about that ki what each and every symbol represent you must know about that this arrow represent what flow of the data it is also written over here represents a connectivity between the various process just see over here i1 is the information one or the input one represented by what represented by this arrow whenever you wanted to represent the information whenever you wanted to flow the data that is always being done by this arrow only right then we have this oval this oval represent the process means whenever we are just using this oval it means certain kind of the processing is being done this is the processing unit for your input data right when we have this rectangle in front of us it means there is an external entity it means it defines the source and destination of the system external entity means source is also represented by this rectangle and the destination is also represented by this rectangle and when we have these two parallel lines it means the storage of the data or the repository of the data where the data is being stored this is represented by these two parallel lines now if you can go back to the same system just see rectangle i have written is as the external ent entity that means this is my source and from where the information is coming input data is coming from the source and the output data data is also coming to my destination which is also again represented by this rectangular box this is data store means every data or the intermediate intermediate data that needs to be stored somewhere is stored into this data store and these arrows are what these arrows are my data flows how my data is being flowing flowing is represented by these arrows and then these circles or the ovals are just the intermediate level processing that is being represented by making use of them you all must know about all these important symbols which are being used for the for developing the dfds or the data flow diagrams right whenever if you need to write it down or if you need to just uh, make make to explain it somewhere first basic diagram of your dfd is this this which is also called as the level 0 dfd we have the three or the four levels in the dfds level 0 level 1 level 2 level 3 or uh, means how much extent we can explain our process we can go to that particular level level 0 means we'll just represent represent the entire process i'll just write over here that it is my igno software system input 1 input 2 and the output means the broadest level of the uh of the explanation of any system is my level 0 broadest means uh i'll just say not very specific not at all specific it just represent the actual input and the output and the system then after that if i am going to move on to the level 1 it is going to explain me more about the about my dfd i'm going to go to the level 2 the more explanation more details of the systems are going to be there i i'll just show you also this is my level 0 of the dfd of my project or the production management system pms is my production management system mean uh, there is a company which is producing any of the product it has developed a production management software system so how my level 0 dfd is going to be shown it will be just tell me about the entry of the data from all the department that my data is coming from 
production planning department data is coming from sales department and it is also coming from the inventory department what will be the name of my data from the production planning i am getting the planning reports from the sales i am getting the orders and from the inventory i am getting the description of the materials output will be what the output of this production management system will be the product and the finished good will be there so this is how my level 0 dfd looks like and this level 0 dfd is of the production management system now i will see the more detailed description description of this entire process now see how my level 1 dfd of this system only the system is production management system and this is the level 1 dfd of my production management system and this is how it looks like can you see it yes yes so what we are seeing into this system we are seeing that a very detailed description of all these processes daily planning 1.0 listing 2.0 3.0 is production 4.0 is material billing then we have the entities as the managers right we have master table which is going to store all the details which are coming and this is how my process is going to be this is how my information is going to flow process table is there these arrows showing me the flow of the information because it is just that it is just the very proof brief overview of your entire process and it, it is the detailed description of the entire process and if i'm going to go and move on to the level 2 of the dft what i'm going to see i'm going to see that a, a much broader perspective of this process only as much as we explain to any of the process similarly we are moving on to the another level of the dft we are not explaining the entire process we are just giving a brief overview of any of the system that means we are talking about the level 0 dft level 1 dft we are going the description of a process that means the level 1 dft now level 2 dft we are describing the entire system in the pictorial form that is your level 2 dft it's easy enough level 0 is the broadest description level 1 a detailed description level 2 is the entire description of is the it's like the maximum description of any of the process that we can make that comes under the level 2 dft understood yes ma'am okay. just see the diagram once again so that it gets clear to you whenever you read it second time just see it okay this is my level 0 dft where it is this is my level 0 dft of the same process production management system it's very basic very very basic okay then this is my level 1 dft which is not very very basic which is quite a detailed description of a process right now after studying about the dfts or the data flow diagrams name also indicate data flow diagram means all those diagrams which are indicating how the data is flowing into the system how the data is entering and how the data is coming out of the system comes under the data flow diagrams now we have the data dictionaries data dictionaries means it is going to explain about the attribute it is just going to give me the information about the attributes type of attributes size names of the related data items range of values data structure definition etc means for example i am using an abbreviation srs right now i everywhere in my document i am just using srs 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 i have not even in on a single place i have written that srs is software requirement specification where i am going to see it is i am just going to see into the starting or onto the catalog which is representing the detailed description of srs i'll just write it down onto a single place that srs means software requirement specification we all have uh, indexes in our books right what those indexes contains those indexes contains the detailed description of every short forms every attributes everything whatever is there into your book if everything whatever is there there into your book that has been mentioned into your indexes similarly the data dictionary data dictionary as the name indicates a data dictionary it is basically a catalog of all the elements that are related to a particular software system right so it could be like everything is written over here like 
it could be like the attribute it could be the type of attribute it could be the size it could be the name of the related data items it could be the range of the values it could be the data structures definitions whatever means whenever we have used the any short form now that short form needs to be explained where that short form is explained that short form is explained into the data dictionary if you have any of the problem just go to the da data dictionary and check if any of the attribute is used into your document and you don't know what this attribute is just check the data dictionary if you wanted to know the type of the attribute then again go back to the data, data dictionary right so that is the function of your data dictionary basically these are all the symbols which you which are used into the data dictionary if it is written like this x is equals to a by b it means x consists of either data element a or b right these are the this is just c is as the data dictionary i'll use all these descriptions all these points and whenever i'll be writing them into my document now i will not be writing this thing i'll just make use of a by b i'll just write x is equals to a x is equals to a plus b if i do not know i'll just check the dictionary that what is the meaning of x is equals to a plus b the meaning of x is equals to a plus b means x consists of the data element a and b the meaning of these two asterisk means i'm just talking about the comments the meaning of this at the rate means it is an identifier. The meaning of these brackets are these are options. This is a separator. So that is a function of data dictionary. In general, also we all know about the dictionaries. Have you understood about this data dictionary? Yes, ma'am. If there is any problem, you can ask me. Uh, we can have the another example also. For example, uh, we just give the short form by us also. Fee deposit can be written as FD, right? course opted may be written as co so whenever i need to check what is this co i'll just go to the data dictionary and i'll check it it is very simple the way we use the dictionaries right any of the short form is there any of the symbol is there i wanted to check the meaning of all those symbols or the short forms i'll just check them into my data dictionary now after that i'm going to go to the next part which is my er diagrams these are again the behavioral models right one is my data flow diagrams Another type of the pictorial representation is my ER diagrams. Have you learned about the ER diagrams earlier? Yes, ma'am. It is entity. Entity relationship diagrams. Okay. So we have the certain set of entities. What is an entity? Entity. Any item that have a unique identity is called as an entity. Right. For example, a class is an ident identity. Why class class is an entity? Class is an entity because we always have a unique class in our system. We have, for example, if we are studying in the school, we have class one, class two, class three, class four. They're all unique. They all have their own identity. That is why classes are considered as the entity. All the students are again an entity. We have the separate students. So every student is unique to us. Then that student will be considered as the entity. We have the different departments in our colleges. So every department is what? Every department is an entity. So whatever, uh, if there is an item, that item could be a class, that item could be a student, department, subject, anything. Okay? If that particular item is unique in nature, it has got its unique identity, then we will say that it is an entity. This is the way to understand what an entity is. You can remember the example of the class. You can remember the example of the student. Every student is different. Every student is unique. That is why it is an entity. Every class is different. That is why it is an entity. Every department is different. That, that is why it is an entity. Every school and college is different. That is why it is an entity. So we have another diagrammatical or the pictorial representation of the data, which is in the form of the entity relationship diagram. Now entities are there. And what is the type of the relationship which is there among the entities that we represent into the ER diagrams. We can see this example also. For example, class is an entity, student is an entity, and the relationship is being shown by this diamond icon. You can see this diamond item icon. It says consist of. What is the meaning of this? The meaning of this is that class consists of student. So there is a relationship that is existing between the class and the students. Right. So that relationship is shown by this consist of uh, diamond shape icon. So whenever we are 
just showing the relationship among the various entities of any particular software system, then we make use of the ER diagram. What the DFDs are doing? DFDs are showing us the flow of the data in a particular process. What ER diagrams are doing? ER diagrams are showing us the relationship among the entities. If there are certain entities into your system, then how these entities are connected with each other, whether there is one to one relationship, where there is one to many relationship, whether there is many to many relationship and so on that are being justified or that are being depicted by the ER diagrams, right? Then we have, we can see like this. Cardinalities are there. Okay, we'll just study about them. We have studied about the entity. We have studied about the relationship. Now we will study about the cardinality and the optionality. What is cardinality? Cardinality. The cardinality represents the relationship between two entities. As I've just discussed to you this, that it shows the relationship. And it, we have given a specific term to that, which is your cardinality. For example, consider the one to many relationship between the two entities class and student a class one to many relationship how it is there i'll just say a single class can have many students so the cardinality is of or the relationship is of one to many then how it could be many to one many students are related to a single class so it is going to go into the opposite manner also so that comes under the cardinality which represent the relationship between the two entities then minimum cardinal to relationship is what when there is one to one relationship a college offers a particular course means there is college offers only the psychology course college offers only the computer science course then what it is it is one to one relationship when it is one to many relationship College offers computer science course also, information technology course also, MC course also, psychology course also. Then we say that it is one to many relationship. What you need to point out or what you need to understand that how it is being shown. When one to one relationship is there, we'll just make use of the single lines. These rectangular box represent your entities. College is an entity, course is an entity. Diamond represent your relationship. Relationship is what offers. These lines shows the kind of the relationship when one to one relationship is there we'll just draw the single lines when one to many relationship is there we'll just represent it by making use of a number of lines one two three lines you all can see that yes ma'am okay right these are all the representation one cardinality means when it can be shown like this also and it can be shown like this also one cardinality means just single single lines joint lines or you can just break the lines into like this it represent that relationship is one to one when relationship is many then this symbol is being used this v or the inverted v we you can see and it is one to n relationship and we'll just mention is over here as n this relationship is one to n when zero or one cardinality is there then it is represented by this and when optional zero or many cardinality is there there could be Either nothing is, there is no relationship or a relationship of one or, or the relationship of many is there, then is, it is represented by this. It's just the representation or the symbolic representation that you all must know. When one cardinality, use the symbol. When n is the highest range of the cardinal, cardinality, then just represent it with an n and this v sign. When zero or one cardinality, just draw zero and one is represented by this uh, vertical symbol. And when there is zero or many cardinality, just represent it with represent it like this. Now I have used the term attribute also. We are going to understand what the attribute. Attribute means the property or the characteristic of an entity. Right. All it is a very common or the general term, which which we uh, should always remember. Attribute is what? Attribute is a property or the characteristic of any entity. Means whatever the property any entity has. For example, uh orange fruit orange right orange fruit has uh has the color orange only color is a attribute right orange fruit is of oval shape most of the time then shape is again an attribute then orange fruit is citrus in taste then taste is another another attribute right 
then the kind of the vitamin orange fruit has that is another attribute so these are all the properties the shape of the fruit the color of the fruit the vitamin the fruit has right so any of the property which any particular entity has is called as attribute just remember attribute means property just understand this right attribute means property or the characteristic of any of the entity that is our, our attribute how we which symbol we make use to represent the attribute the ovals are used to represent represent the attribute these are all the ovals right and entity is represented by a rectangular circle so rectangle right so student is an entity why student is, is an entity why i'm saying student is an ent entity it is unique mom yeah student is unique in nature very good okay so student entity has got various properties student can have the marks student belongs to a particular class student can have an address student can have a roll number student can have his own name student can also have a father's name student can also have a phone number student can also uh, also have a sibling right so all these are what all these are the attributes of the student so all the attributes are represented by making use of these ovals right so we just need to remember two things about the attribute represented by making use of the ovals or the circles and they represent the property or the characteristic of the entity i hope it is understood now now next is we don't have to go through this was about the er diagram right ER diagram is clear or uh, I need to repeat it? It's clear. It's clear? Good. Now we are going to go on to our next uh, not software matrices. Software matrices are the software measurement. Now we need to just, uh, for example, uh, how can you understand the software matrices? For example, there is a product. For example, product is the oil, right? What we do, we just measure the quantity of the oil, right? We just measure the vessel in which the oil is to be kept. We also need to have the measuring instrument in order to give the oil to somebody. Similarly, we also have certain measurements or the matrices by which we can measure our software also. The two important things which needs to be measured are the size of the software and the line of the codes into the software. Software measures, there are two common software measures. The first is the size of the software, which indicates what? Which indicates the magnitude of the software system. Basically, it represents how much will be the requirement of the memory, what size of the memory is required for the software, how much maintenance effort is required, how much development time is required for the development of the software. So that comes under your size measurement right it is a kind of the measure second is your loc loc is always the lines of the codes means when you code the software it just indicate the number of lines which will be written for the uh, coding part of the software how many lines will be there into your software that comes under the line of the codes in your software so in the case of the software matrices or the software measures you need to just remember the two things the size of the software and the loc of the software loc is your line of the codes of the software next is your okay we are also done with this requirement analysis so we have learned a number of things in our requirement analysis what were all those we have learned about the environment model we have learned about the behavior model before that we have done the requirement we have learned about the requirement gathering tools right so four types of tools were there the record review on-site observation interview and the questionnaire then after that we move on to the system architecture which needs to be present it could be an environmental model and it could also be a behavior model in the case of the behavior model we have learned about the dfds that is the data flow diagrams which are going to be of various levels level 0 level 1 and also of the level 2 we have seen the level 0 and level 1 then all the kinds of the pictorial representation or the symbols that are being used in designing the dfds these are all the symbols we make use of an arrow we make use of an oval to represent the process we make use of a rectangular box in order to show the external entity which can be in the form of the source or the, or the destination and we make use of the two parallel lines which shows us the data sources after that we move we move on to 
we just saw the level 0 and the level 1 DFT. Then after that, we move on to the ER diagrams or the entity relationship diagrams. These are all the entity relationship diagrams. We have learned about the cardinalities. And then after that, which represent the relationship. That is one-to-one -one relationship, one-to-many relationship, many-to-many -many relationship, and so on. And after that, we have also learned about the data dictionaries. We have also learned about the attributes. And after that, we have just moved on to the software matrices, which is the size and the LOC are the two matrices. I hope all these points are clear to you. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, what we are going to do, we are just going to switch on our camera, if you all can. And uh, I'm just going to take a screenshot of this. Just switch on your camera. So you are all actually listening now? Yes, ma'am. So any of the problem till now? No, ma'am. No? So we have completed our requirement analysis phase. After that, we are going to go to our next phase no. or, the un or the third phase of our SDLC, which is also our unit three, which is our software designing phase. So I think we will start it in our next class only. What do you all say? Yes, this is good, Mom. Uh, today we studied the chapter. This is enough for today, I think. Okay, okay. I also think like that. So we'll just start it in our next class, which will be our second step of our SDLC. What you all need to do is just go and download this book and revise it at, at least once because it is mostly the theoretical chapter. You just have to establish the analogies and then relations among your real life situations and then only you will be able to understand it in a much better way so in order to remember it for forever you just can do just just brush it, brush it up once this entire pdf or the topics that we have started then you will be able to understand it in a better way you all can do that i don't think it's going to take much time of yours yes uh, i will attempt to do that yeah, just revise it once, okay? And we will meet in our next class. Any of the doubt, if there, you can ask me right now, or otherwise I'm signing it off. Uh, uh, Ma'am, sometimes uh, I'm not hearing as clearly. You're not able to is hear? Is it my problem or f is it for all? Uh, uh, sometimes it is connecting and disconnecting. Is it problem my... for all or it's only for me? Okay, you can. Uh, you no, all just answer the question. Because of your no, internet. All the audio, all the audio, bro. So it could be your internet connection from my side. Yeah, it is yeah. fine. Okay, okay. Ma okay ma yeah, just check that once again. It just kept on happening in the online classes. No worries. Okay. So just leaving now thank you for today's lecture have a good thank day you. have a good day thank you thank you thank you, thank you. thank you thank you